it is a problem that brands from the West or from abroad in general, they assume that they have a very high brand awareness in those markets, even without really having a lot of presence there, and that their brands are superior in comparison to maybe some of the local brands that might have been there for 20, 30 years. So the, the willingness to overinvest in local presence, in doing top of funnel branding awareness kind of investments, in being competitive from a price perspective, bundles, free gifts, free shipping, like they're very often that willingness is very low given that they have been successful for decades in other markets and just because they are 10% more expensive than competition, yeah, but I'm a German brand that stands for something, right? And so there's a there's the expectation that the brand awareness they have in their own home markets or home continents is immediately uh, applicable to Southeast Asia, to Malaysia. And I think that for us is a process that we have to go through where we really have to explain those brands that Reputation in France, Italy, or Germany doesn't mean too much if you don't go through the motions of building your brand in Southeast Asia as well. This is the e-commerce in Southeast Asia podcast with Matthew Shoney, session number three. Let's get started. Welcome to the e-commerce in SE Asia podcast, where it's all about understanding and winning e-commerce in Southeast Asia. And now your host, Matthew Shoney. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I am very excited to welcome this week's guest, Hans-Peter Russell, uh, also known as HP. HP is the founder and CEO of Momentum Commerce, a leading e-commerce enabler agency headquartered in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Prior to starting Momentum Commerce, HP spent six plus years at Lazada as a co-founder and chief operating officer, chief commercial officer, and then CEO of Lazada Malaysia, and then was the chief international officer at a regional level. Welcome to the show, and thanks for taking the time to speak with me, HP. Thanks for having me. Hey. So what's new? How have you been? It's been uh, about, about two years since the last time we spoke. Where are you these days and what's life like been uh, after COVID? Yeah, no, I've, I'm, I'm splitting my time between um, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where, where Momentum is, is headquartered, and my home country, Austria. I think thanks to our business model, it has allowed me to travel a fair bit, also doing a bunch of business development work for uh, our existing and also new European clients that we're onboarding to bring uh, into Southeast Asia and that we're helping scale their business. And so it has allowed me to you know, spend some time here, uh, spend some time with the team and, and travel between the, the, two, the two homes of mine. That's awesome. So I, I, I really appreciate you joining me when I was thinking about Malaysia uh, and doing a podcast episode specifically on Malaysia. I couldn't think of anyone that had a better background and, and better experience in Malaysia as well as kind of a European-American perspective to maybe translate the dis- dif- difference as well. So, yeah, I really appreciate you joining me. So, the, yeah, this, this podcast is going to be mostly focused on the Malaysia market, and then we'll move into some more Southeast Asia-related topics uh, as well. But I'll kick it off by just talking about some of the like macroeconomic data for the listeners that are not so familiar with Malaysia. But Malaysia uh, has uh, 32 million people, according to the IMF. Uh, that's the, the, the second smallest population out of the six Southeast Asian markets that we generally talk about when we're talking about e-commerce, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. But it has the second highest GDP per capita at 13,107 US dollars, just behind Singapore and nearly double Thailand. And from the Asian Development Bank, we grew 6% or 3.1% in 2021, expected 6% in 2022. Uh, and then just like all the other markets in Southeast Asia, we had really, really explosive growth, um, 47% year over year from 2020 to 2021. And then I yeah, expected 14% year on year growth up until 2025. So unique market, uh, relatively small population, but higher GDP per capita. So yeah, Malaysia is uh, a beautiful country as well. 
But you know, before we jump back in, maybe you can just introduce us to Momentum Commerce. Uh, what what led you to starting Momentum Commerce? Yeah, so I think um, in summer 2018, when I was uh, responsible for for the international business at Lazada, I was also tasked to have a look at the regional enabler space, which is basically a, a concept that Alibaba wanted to bring over to Southeast Asia uh, for some time. And there has been some incubation. There have been some players in the past already, but nothing really at scale. And by looking at the landscape, I... I I can, still, I can still remember the, the reaction of the chief of staff of Cho Tsai, who basically, after sending the overview, mentioned to me, that's all, that's all there is. And then it surprised me because it was still a huge list, but no one really operating at scale, at, at, at the level of professionalism that is required to do a good job here, and, and with some exception, obviously. And so I, I, I told myself, if I, if I ever leave Lazada, that's what I'm going to do. And then, and so... Then, then at the end of the year, it, 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 after getting married and after being on a longer honeymoon, you know, leaving Lazada, I think it it was time. I, w- I went back to my initial promise and then I bumped into my co-founder by accident at the Lazada, Lazada 11.11 party. He was a colleague of mine before at Lazada Malaysia. And then so we sat together after the event and, and we're like, okay, what opportunities are out there? And and so and so I realized that this is a huge opportunity and I, I wanted to stay in the region. I wanted to stay in the e-commerce space, and I wanted to utilize some of the relationships and network that I built over the years. And and so it was a very natural next step uh, for, for me then with my co-founder to start Momentum and and start helping brands scale their their business. I also had a lot of interactions with local brands, especially. And during my time or our time at Lazada, it was really the focus was on the big global international brands in the end, and and a lot of those local or regional brands that felt a bit neglected. And I felt, you know, there is a lot of lot of opportunity for those, you know, hundreds and thousands of local and regional brands to scale within Southeast Asia. And so I, I also felt that there is there's enough space for a new player to to help both global brands professionalize their business even further uh, with the experience that we had at, at, at Lazada, as well as helping smaller local, smaller regional brands scale their business within Southeast Asia. And yeah, that's when we get started. And just for the audience, Momentum's headquartered in, in Malaysia. Momentum does uh, some uh, cross-border management as well, but really you know, deep specialization in, in Malaysia. So with that being mentioned, uh, HP, when you're talking with prospective brands about entering into Malaysia e-commerce, how do you describe it? What are some of the things that you kind of communicate to to explain what's happening in the Malaysian e-commerce world? I mean, it's it usually brands have have a particular interest to strengthen or establish their presence in the entire Southeast Asia. And the question then always is where to start. If you phase it into one or two or three phases, then or phase one, two, three, where would you start first? Where would you expand to, et cetera? And then fundamentally it comes down to the ease and cost of doing business uh, that that includes language barriers that includes how easy is it to set up a company uh, that is maybe owned by a foreign entity what are some of the the, the visa and immigration rules for you to to establish a presence etc right and so and so malaysia is an, is, a, is a nice country to start expanding within southeast asia obviously singapore is all, is always and, and was always um, number one for a lot of expats who want to have kind of a soft entry into the region. Uh, but then it's also very expensive. Talent uh, is very expensive. Setting up, establishing a, a company might be might be swift and, and, and easy, but then operating at scale can become very expensive. Malaysia then, on the other side, allows for you know, a, a, an affordable cost of living environment. Um, it allows for, because of the language advantage, uh, with, with English, Malay, and then also Chinese, to to operate both in English-speaking Southeast Asian markets like the Philippines, it allows to treat Singapore operationally as um, you know the most southern state of Malaysia, uh, and and it also allows for having cross-border presence in Indonesia due to due to the very similar language languages of Bahasa Malaysia and Bahasa Indonesia, and and so it, it's a very good 
it's a very good place to, to start. And then also when it comes, especially in e-commerce, when it comes to connectivity, I think Malaysia airport is quite a, a big hub and is basically covered by a lot of the, the big airlines. It has Malaysia itself has a couple of low carrier local airlines. So the connectivity between Southeast Asian cities with a hub in Kuala Lumpur is quite an advantage when you are running your own brand.com with your stock in Malaysia, etc. So it's, for me, the better Singapore to start a business in Southeast Asia, to have your hub, your headquarter there. And so it's, it's easy to explain that to brand because I made the decision to, to incorporate and headquarter Momentum in, in Malaysia. And so it's, it's an easy explanation on all the rationals and, and a lot of brands then follow that, that path and say, okay, you know what, let's start in the English speaking countries. Let's get Indonesia on top as well, because uh, language wise uh, with, with Malaysians, you can get at least started. And because of the English speaking advantage, you also have Singapore and the Philippines. And so you cover four markets right away. And then on top of that, if you also want to do business in, in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, then a lot of Chinese speakers in, in Malaysia. So even that world would be open to you later on. Yeah, that's a really great, uh, great way to frame it that I, I never really thought about it. But it is, you know, when I think Malaysia, I think melting pot, uh, 100% uh, ethnic Malay, Chinese, uh, kind of a very heavy Indonesian influence. And yeah, cer- certainly uh, a great talent. And another thing that I think about is, um, you know, uh, the kind of the free trade openness. Uh, it seems like Malaysia has always been kind of at the forefront in the region. Uh, of course, Singapore has as well. But it seems like Malaysia has been, you know, uh, definitely at the forefront of opening up towards uh, cross-border uh, international e-commerce. Could you maybe just just mention uh, a couple things about uh, that that you've seen over the ten years you, you you've lived in Malaysia? Sure, I think the openness to to have foreign investment is is very high. I think if you compare it to some other markets where you know you have a lot of foreign foreign investment rules and foreign ownership rules. Certain sectors are protected. There are a lot of high barriers of and restrictions to to incorporate a business in certain industries that are protected, and there are a lot of uh, you know requirements for high paid up capital that needs to be that needs to be paid up right right from the start. I think I think that those barriers are much lower in Malaysia. And then I think historically, I think Malaysia always had. Or focused on, on a lot of trade with, with other markets, very, very also Western oriented. And, and you, you can really see, I mean, just one of the things that we were involved in the digital free trade zone that was opened up, I think in 2017, uh, between the government and, and Alibaba. It was uh, as part of the EWTP vision of, of Jack Ma, the first digital free trade zone was opened outside of China, was opened in Malaysia with a big uh, free trade zone uh, at, at, at the airport. And w- with the intention and, and the vision to take over kind of from Singapore being the number one logistics hub in the region. So obviously during COVID, uh, all these things uh, got delayed or deprioritized, but I think you, you, you can still see that the, because of the strategic location, uh, the, the Straits of Malacca, a lot of ships go through there, et cetera. And having those those big national carriers, I think there's a lot of lot of lot of focus on 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 increasing the importance of Kuala Lumpur and then Malaysia as a logistics hub, and a lot of policies and a lot of strategic projects uh, are, are being launched there. And and also from a from a connectivity, I think you can you can you have uh, sea, air, train, road, all those into neighboring countries, and it really allows for a very flexible usage of of those transportation modes to to be active in that space super interesting so hp you've been in malaysia for 10 years now and e-commerce has grown like crazy and 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 transformed in the region massively year over year since then what's happening in 2022 that's particularly interesting compared to you know when you when you were just getting started in in 2012 what are what are some of the big differences that you're seeing so from a competitive environment i feel nothing has changed it is a very competitive environment just the names involved or have changed over time i think when lazada came into the picture there were some local incumbents and lazada took over them lazada was the number one and shopee took over and by now 
probably is the biggest incumbent. And, and, and now this year, the biggest, the biggest shift that I've seen is, uh, I mean, TikTok has been there for a couple of years as a social media platform, but with the launch of TikTok Shop and the whole incubation of the ecosystem around TikTok service providers, we have really seen a, a, a dramatic shift and an increase of the importance of that uh, new social commerce environment. I think even when you look into the people that are now working at TikTok Malaysia, a lot of Excelzad and Shopee colleagues are there. So you could see the strategic focus on, on making that social media platform kind of a big commercial e-commerce platform, and, and it really works. We started to focus on this uh, in, in early March, and, and by now, and this is kind of roughly a little bit more than half a year, some of the brands that, that, that uh, some of our clients, TikTok is already the number two platform behind Shopee and ahead of Lazada. And I honestly would have not expected uh, that uh, or, or, or that to happen that fast within kind of barely six months. And, and so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very excited about this uh, and I'm, I'm very curious also what's going to happen, but I would not be surprised if TikTok gains even more importance and gives Lazada Shopee a hard time. We have also seen, unfortunately, I mean, already during COVID, but especially now since the beginning of the year, a lot of Malaysia headquartered platforms or with big operations and platforms having to release and, and fire a lot of team members. IPOs being postponed or not being very successful. And especially when it comes to the dominance of Shopee, especially those guys, I, 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 we, we feel that what we have seen, um, they had to release a lot of people, way more than, than Lazada. We see that uh, there seems to be a lot of pressure, but to, for the platforms to start making money or losing less, you see that platforms start to increase their rates, their commissions, and basically try to monetize the platform much more and be way more aggressive to, to monetize and generate revenues than, than in the past where they were you know, giving away a lot of freebies, free gifts, uh, free shipping, you know, free everything. Uh, so, so there seems to be a lot of pressure. And we feel that, or I, I can sense uh, from, from our conversations with the platforms that that might benefit Lazada now in the short and midterm, given that they have a very strong balance sheet thanks to to Alibaba and and that they showed some patience uh, during the last years losing losing market share but now it seems that when we look at the pure numbers that they're catching up again and getting closer to to Shopee. Yeah, it's really interesting. I I think I saw on social media that uh, Momentum is uh, official TikTok shop partner. Are you are you doing TikTok shop with with all your brands? Is that kind of a standard that you recommend now? It's uh, you know this is another channel that that all brands should be selling on, uh, or is it still a little bit early days for TikTok shop? Yeah, so so indeed we got kind of all platforms have these awards that they give out for the close partners and the performance, and we're lucky that we two months in a row became the number one TikTok TikTok service provider TSP in Malaysia. And what, what I can see from looking purely at the, the appetite, every, everyone wants to do it. No one knows how to do it. And luckily, we started early in the year and, and started to you know, uh, crack it and, 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 and figure it out. And that really allowed us to accelerate our activities there. And I think it, it, you know, it took us three years to get to a certain amount of clients. And it took us three months, four months to get to the same number of TikTok clients. So even those clients who maybe have another service provider or they feel they don't need a service provider because they have in-house capabilities, even those reached out to us and said, guys, it's, it's all good and our setup is quite solid, but on TikTok, we have no idea. We have no clue. Please help us. And so TikTok became for us not only just another channel or just another service, but it became something that is, I think today in Malaysia at least, not well established amongst other peers of us, other competitors of us. And that really has allowed us to not only deepen our relationship with existing clients, but also start initiating new relationships with new clients that, uh, you know, in the, in the past didn't see the need uh, to talk to us because of other engagements or, or internal capabilities. And so, so that really accelerated, I, I believe, our reputation even more. And so for us, it's very exciting because after all these years of, you know, pretty much in Malaysia, Lazada and Shopee dominating, and then with Zalora, obviously in the fashion space, 
there is now a new player and and everyone which which kind of shakes up the tree a bit and everyone starts to to motion around and shift around and start assessing what that means for them and so there's a lot of moving pieces uh which for us as a service provider is always always very good because then when when the pieces start to move then very often uh, you know they need support to to fill in some of the blanks and the gaps that that start to open up that's uh, it's, it's it's super interesting i i'm i'm kind of confused and I, and i have been for a while and it, it it makes so much sense for tiktok to move into tiktok shop and yeah the social platform's been around southeast asia for a while but tiktok shop is just starting to you know launch i think in europe and and, and us but you know, at its core, it's it, it makes a lot of sense. Why drive traffic outside of the platform to conversion and pass links around? But why 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 hasn't uh, you know Facebook, uh, Instagram done this? Do you have any insights or you know thoughts on like why TikTok has went forward with this approach and and, and seemingly has had so much success when Facebook has had so many years to work on it and never really never really pushed it forward? I, I don't have an hypothesis. For that, I just have the observation of uh, that Lazada and Shopee both, as an e-commerce platform, tried with this whole shop attainment push and the games and the live streams and the the videos and and the concerts, try to retain their customers to do things beyond shopping. And to some extent, that might or might not have worked. For sure, it increased the stickiness. For sure, you know, with all these super apps in Southeast Asia. Customers are used to do more things than just the core, like subscribing or consuming the core service of an app. And they're now with Grab and AirAsia, et cetera, they're, they're used to have multiple services in, in the so-called super apps. But it's it's still, the problem is still, it's it's, it's a shopping app, right? So so at the core of, at the essence of what it is, Lazada and Shopee, they're shopping apps. Whereas TikTok is quite a, social media network that already has that stickiness and the way they moved into e-commerce and the way they started to move into selling products as well is, is, is different than, than how Facebook or WhatsApp or Instagram kind of, maybe, maybe, maybe Instagram would have had the opportunity, but it, everything is driven by that content create economy. And if you start spending some time on TikTok and, and the way, the way content is, is pushed to you and the way that like the algorithm just works much better than everything else I've, I've ever seen in the past, right? Like following three or four hashtags or consuming videos for 10 versus three seconds just makes a difference in the type of content you get going forward. And, and so my, my observation is just that they have it much easier to pivot from a social platform to a social commerce platform versus Lazada Shopee moving from a, a commerce platform to a social platform. Why and if and uh, why Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, have not done it to the same extent or why they tried and didn't work, I don't know. But at least the observation between the established e-commerce platforms that try to become kind of and provide the shop attainment environment versus doing it the other way around. I think I've observed that the other way around is, is just moving much faster and is, is providing a much more genuine, authentic way to engage with the brands, with the products and and, and opening the, the the door for a much more authentic buying and purchasing uh, experience, which is based on con- consumption of content by people that kind of you trust or people that you follow rather than content that is thrown down your throat by the brands or by the platform. And everyone knows that's just paid content that you're consuming. It's real advertising versus the authenticity of the content that you consume on TikTok and then leads to kind of an immediate conversion, that just seems to work out much better uh, that way than the other way around. So moving to kind of the ops in the supply chain side of the world, what does an efficient uh, operation supply chain warehousing uh, setup look like in Malaysia? You've got uh, West Malaysia, East Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, as I understand, you know, definitely the largest uh, population hub. How does this uh, usually get set up for incumbent brands or enablers? Do you have warehouses in East and West Malaysia? Any tips or recommendations? Indeed, I think we, we are working with a warehouse provider, strategic partner 
where we have uh, seven warehouses across Malaysia. I think two of them are in East Malaysia, one in Sabah, one in Sabah, Sar one in Sabah, one in Sarawak, and five are in in West Malaysia, and then there's one more in Singapore as well. I think a, a, a typical layout would be a like centralized uh, distribution center in the Klang Valley area near the airport, which then for let's say D2C brands or brand.com operations, you have good uh, connectivity to the airport and, and intra-ASEAN um, logistics and fulfillment capabilities. And then having the stock in Malaysia in for most platforms, it also allows you to you know, ship to Singapore and be considered a local brand from the eyes of a Singaporean platform, given that the customs clearance, et cetera, and uh, between Malaysia and Singapore in both directions is quite smooth and efficient and quite fast. Uh, and it allows for next day shipping in Singapore as it would for, allow for the same uh, next day shipping in Johor Bahru in the south of Malaysia. So that is almost the same fulfillment solution. And if you are, for example, a fashion brand, Malaysia would even allow you through Zalora to operate in other Southeast Asian markets through the Zalora fulfillment solution. So from a pure number of channels that you can uh, be live with centralized stock in Malaysia, you have like two uh, Lazada, Malaysia, Singapore, two Shopee, Malaysia, Singapore channels to be live immediately, and then four to five Salora countries, if you are a fashion brand. So that is a, a very elegant way to start and be present in a lot of markets at the same time with one stock, which is very important for a lot of brands because they don't want to split up their stock too much and all those working capital costs and very often fighting for the stock to get it into the Southeast Asia and then not being available for the other markets, their other channels is a big hurdle. And, and that way you have those synergies with one one stock location entertaining six, seven, eight channels right from the start. Uh, that's really, really, really insightful. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, HP. You know, doing this for, for 10 years, six years at Lazada and then uh, Momentum for the last four-ish, uh, you've worked with a lot of different brands, uh, a lot of different folks have entered Southeast Asia for the first time. So you've probably seen some some wins and some losses, but you know, from that experience, what are the biggest misconceptions uh, that people have when entering Malaysia from abroad, from your perspective? Very often, it is it is a problem that brands from the West or or from abroad, like from abroad in general, they assume that they have a very high brand awareness in in those markets, even without really having a lot of presence there. And that their brands are superior in comparison to maybe some of the local brands that might have been there for 20, 30 years. So the the willingness to overinvest in local presence, in doing top of funnel branding awareness kind of investments, in being competitive from a price perspective, bundles, free gifts, free shipping, like they're very often that that willingness is very low given that they have been successful for decades in other markets and just because they are 10% more expensive than competition, yeah, but I'm a German brand that stands for something, right? And so there's a there's the expectation that the brand awareness they have in their own home markets or home continents is, immediate, is immediately uh, applicable to, to uh, Southeast Asia, to Malaysia. And I think that for us is a, a process that we have to go through where we really have to explain those brands that, you know, reputation in France, Italy, or Germany doesn't mean too much if you don't go through the motions of building your brand in Southeast Asia as well. And so that usually takes a bit of time. And then in general, that that Malaysia, even even like we both know that Southeast Asia is not one market with all its, you know, diverse cultures and languages, etc. But even Malaysia is not a diverse, or uh, even Malaysia itself is a diverse market. You have the Malays, the majority of the population, 65 to 70 percent, who are predominantly uh, Muslims. You have the Chinese demographics, the Indian demographics. And so even within Malaysia, the way you position yourself can be very diverse. And, 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 and so that's, that's something that people often underestimate, that 
localization and, and, and real local engagement with the demographic that you actually want to cater to or where you feel that you have the strongest connection with and biggest opportunity is very important, not only across countries within Southeast Asia, but even across demographics within Malaysia. Yeah, it seems like a very complex puzzle to crack from the branding side. <laughs> it's such a such a diverse country. That resonates so well, that lack of top of funnel investment. Um, that's that's something that uh, I've I've seen uh, a few times, definitely less than you. But yeah, I mean there's there's quite a bit of research tools that are out there. I guess you could you could check branded search volume uh, and do some surveying. But you know, like any any tips on how to kind of gather and assess what is the the brand awareness and how much top of funnel investment you need to, to to be allocating? Is that is that something that you guys consult and advise on? So usually, in especially for brands that don't have a lot of past performance data, historical performance data that maybe enter the market or that uh, completely from scratch, or they only had some small offline activities. Part of our engagement with brands and, and usually the first lag after being appointed their service provider here is that we, we come up with a, with a business plan with a suggestion for the first two to three years, broken down into quarters and months even, where we, where we collect all those data points that you just mentioned, keyword data, we look into competitive environment, we look into price bands and price ranges in that sub-subcategory that the brand will be playing in. We get all these data points um, from a lot of research offline and online, and then and then kind of consolidate this into the first cut of a business plan. And then after a couple of iterations, we, we present to the brand what we think is required, what marketing investments are required to achieve a certain organic traffic with a certain conversion rate that will lead to a certain revenue in year one, right? And 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 then how do we top it up? With paid traffic and what's the what's the the cost, the CPC for certain channels. What's the what's the cost for certain marketing programs, marketing barters, influencer engagements, etc. So we can accelerate kind of that brand building activities a bit more. Is something that is usually part of what we do, and is usually kind of happening in the in the in the first lag of the relationship while we are figuring out the operating model, while we maybe bring the product into the region, into the market, do the product registration, the importation, while we do all that, we go through a proper plan and, and, and plan the, the required resources in each market to get, get us to the, the desired outcome. Oh, really interesting. So next question. So coming from an EU background, what are some of the biggest eye-opening differences about Southeast Asia and uh, Western e-commerce? I think if you if you compare the landscape uh, and the number of marketplaces alone, the relevant marketplaces in the EU, if if I'm correct, and you probably know that better, but I think Amazon in in, in Europe maybe as the number one by far has a forty maybe fifty percent market share, and then there are a lot of lot of like vertical marketplaces, category specific, and then there's a lot of brand.com activities. On the flip side, if you go to, to Southeast Asia, you would probably have Lazada, Shopee, Zalora. If the top three already make up 85 to 90% of the e-commerce market, and then you would have in some countries, one or two local players like Tokopedia, Pukalapak, and Indo, et cetera, and then some brand.com activities. And, and, and so the, the, the presence and the importance of those big marketplaces is quite big as opposed to in Europe, where even even I, if I purchase something like furniture or, or clothes for the house, Amazon is maybe the, the number one spot to start. But very often, I just end up at, at vertical marketplaces that I've never heard of before, but they seem to be big and reliable and have a better assortment in their category, their vertical than, than Amazon itself. So so that's maybe one thing. The second thing, the role of brand.com in Europe seems to be much, in the US probably, seems to be much higher than in Southeast Asia. Very often, brands in Southeast Asia use it as a kind of branding environment. I think the trend will, or what, what we observe is that that more and more brands focus more and more on brand.com. They don't want to be as much dependent on, on, on the platforms uh, as they used to be. They kind of built a bit of a business there, but then they have a different strategy, different rational things they want to do on, on their own brand.coms. I also see that 
Southeast Asia, with, with with all the you know all algorithms and all the and 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 all the social commerce activities, really allows for smaller local brands to 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 rise. I feel you you do have that on Amazon, and I mean you worked at Branded, right? And, and there were a lot of smaller brands, but we also looked at that space, and a lot of these brands are like three or four or five SKUs, and they're rather best sellers of OEM products rather than what what what, what like we or what, what I define as, as as real brands and and in Southeast Asia on the flip side there is a lot of smaller brands, new brands incubated by influencers. And I think those influencers and KOL activities really have allowed for the incubation of new beauty brands and a lot of beauty brands in the space. Something that that will lead me to the next and last thing is also the role of social commerce and the role of TikTok and the role of influencers is by far more important in in the way businesses and brands set themselves up to scale uh, than 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 in Europe. I think we one of our clients, for example, wants to launch a lot of TikTok shops in in the in in, in Europe, but I think UK just stopped those TikTok shop activities again, and it's just a different different environment in which influencers and social selling is not as big as in as in Southeast Asia. So that's maybe some of the, the biggest differences I see. Yeah, it's a really interesting point about D2C. And that's that's definitely something that I see is uh, there's just not a lot of D2C brand stores. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's probably some different factors at play here. Like, you know, maybe, you know, one would be the, the supply chain, kind of the operation integration complexity. It's not really worth battling that. And then the other is that, uh, the commission structures are still really low in the marketplaces of Southeast Asia, right? Uh, relative to what you see in U.S. and Europe, where, you know, in a lot of cases, you're you're pay- definitely paying 15 to 20 percent uh, referral commission to Amazon, and then using the FBA network plus advertising, <laughs> Amazon advertising, you know, you can pretty easily spend, you know, 40 percent of your, you know, your your, your top line uh, going to Amazon, and it's. Um, I wouldn't say that it's 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 very very cheap, you know. Like the the marketplaces are definitely taking their share, um, but it it seems to be more competitive here. And for that reason, the you know the the fee structures of the marketplaces is still much lower. So therefore, maybe you don't need to 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 make your landing page and point of conversion your D to C store. Any other things that you think would be be causing that in uh, in, in Southeast Asia? No, I think for sure when I talk about competitiveness, also the the platforms try to be, to be very competitive, right? And so, as as you said, it's it's much more cheaper to be listed on Lazada, Shopee than it is on, on on Amazon US for sure. And and TikTok, for example, right now is flooding the market now with lower rates again, right? But then if you look into into China, how this developed in China, TikTok is already charging, I think. 15 or 20 percent uh, commissions. So, so that that will come, right? And so the moment, the moment, it's going to be too expensive to rely on marketplaces for your e-commerce strategy. And the moment you have like, especially in categories where you don't have these high margins, like fashion, beauty, maybe, but then electronics and FMCG, you simply can't afford to to pay those those commissions anymore. And so we will see a, a shift to kind of higher commission structures and higher like platforms demanding a higher share of wallet. And that will cause a lot of vertical marketplaces that then again allow maybe for lower cost of doing business and brand.com or social commerce channels that, that are owned by the brands. You, you, will, you will see that gaining importance but that's not necessarily what we see today yet um and so so i believe that for the next at least talking about malaysia malaysia singapore there will still be competition for those customers that you showed you talked about the number of people i think is it 550 million 600 million people here with i think the biggest young population in the world which is i think defined by under 30 years old very soon to be in southeast asia so a lot of people that that trade up that can buy brands for the very first time that it can you know um, migrate from OEM 
imported uh, products to real international global brands. You don't want to miss as a brand. You don't want to miss that bus and and the moment kind of the the middle class, the affordability is there. You 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 don't want to not be then ready to engage with these millions of new customers. So I I believe that there's still going to be a lot of fight for for that custom acquisition. And I believe that that will still remain a very competitive environment. Yeah, Southeast Asia e-commerce is is fascinating and and, and changing so fast. Uh, If you could give just one piece of advice to a new D2C e-commerce brand startup that's uh, moving into Southeast Asia or uh, just an incumbent you know brand leader that's that's moving in for the first time what would that one piece of advice be especially in e-commerce so it's especially in our industry with a strong focus on e-commerce and starting and building a brand i think focusing on unit economics and having a robust and, and scalable business model is is key i think we, we just went through two years pandemic we will continue right now we are kind of in recession like in a recession like environment at least in the western world uh, here in europe and, and and you never you never know what happens next and obviously uh, the the past has shown that focusing on custom acquisition focusing on building network effects and the big big uh, beast uh, like lazada or, or other platforms and other brands on the back of venture capital uh, debt financing etc worked very well but we can also see now that a lot of these customer, a lot of these companies and industries are suffering, having to fire people, massive down rounds, not able to raise more money, um, having to close. I think every day on LinkedIn something pops up where, like, you know, two years ago everyone was like, "Wow, these these guys are doing well," but it was always a, a, not a very sustainable and organic kind of growth. And and so maybe it takes a bit longer. Maybe maybe you need to show more patience. But if you focus on, on unit economics and the scalable and robust business model, maybe it takes a bit longer, but you can dive through some of those downtimes and you can survive those downtimes, even if you then cannot raise the next round, et cetera. It, it doesn't matter because the business is able to, to sustain and, and, and finance itself. So that would be my advice. Yeah, I think that's wonderful advice, actually. I mean, it's get the, get your house in order, make sure you have good unit economics, uh, and make sure that your CAC is reasonable and that you're, you know, you're growing in a, in, in a healthy manner. I, I think, uh, the, the D to C brand, you know, as, uh, as it's called, I think by most like venture, venture capitalists, the D to C brand, D to C e-commerce world has definitely seen, you know, kind of a lot of, uh, upside downs, uh, periods in the past, like, uh, you know, a couple, a couple of years. And I think it's exactly, you know, the root cause is exactly what you said is it's uh, kind of unsustainable growth practices, you know, it's to basically just become evident once the funding dries up that, you know, you can't continue growing at the same rate uh, and your profit margins are, you know, uh, just not so strong to, to justify the CAC that you need. So I, I, I agree 100%. I think that's the foundation of any successful mm. uh, e-commerce business is get, get the unit economics right. And then you can validate or invalidate whether or not it's even worth proceeding, right? It, I think it, you can get hung up on this sometimes because you can kind of, you know, tell yourself that uh, once I reach a certain scale, I'll be able to drive down, you know, the costs that sit inside of those unit economics. And that'll give me more time to play around with. But, you know, and that's true to an extent, but I think you, you know, yeah, I, from my perspective, you nailed it on the head. Like that's that's the number one thing that I look for when I'm trying to start a, you know, an e-commerce brand. And I'm, I've been through you know four or five of them now, and, and several acquisitions as well along the way. So, mm. just uh, t- two more questions because I know we're we're approaching time, and you're you're a busy guy. Uh, so the, the next one is, uh, I think, always the toughest question, <laughs> but I ask all the guests, and it's to to pull out your crystal ball. And give a forecast of what you think e-commerce in Malaysia is going to look like in the next five years, five years from now. I mean, if you look at simply some of the the macro numbers and there are like Temasek and Google reports, obviously with Malaysia being the second smallest country and some of the other markets showing the same or even higher growth. And on the back of kind of a population that is like two, three, four, five times the size of Malaysia, there are obviously in the long run, a lot of advantages 
having kind of a strong presence in Indonesia, being a country that is, is uh, such so big, or Vietnam, which is really starting to catch up, right, and, and is a 90 million people country. I think in the in the very long run, Malaysia will for sure lose out in some of the advantages it, advantages it has today. However, I think when we talk about five years, that's not really long long term. I think that's like short and midterm. And and I, I I do believe that when it comes to some of the more sophisticated cross border logistic solutions, I think Malaysia will will have an upper hand here and, and and might gain of importance will gain of importance compared to Singapore, given that you simply don't have so much space in Singapore to build warehouses, for example. So I think when it comes to logistics, Malaysia will 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 gain an importance. I I, I believe that Malaysia being a Muslim country predominantly. And having a very, to some extent, conservative definition of, of, of halal and, and Muslim of fashion and halal products and a very strict certification processes from the local certification body, which is very well respected, for example, in the, in the Gulf region, in the, in the Middle East region. I think uh, Malaysia has a chance to become a very important manufacturing hub and manufacturing cluster for the Muslim population worldwide. Yeah, I think there are 1.7 billion Muslims and proper fashion attire, uh, halal uh, FMB and FMGG products is something that on the back of that logistic solution, you know, c- can be delivered globally. And, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of manufacturing will, will, will happen in Malaysia and Indonesia for the global population of, of Muslims. So I think here Malaysia can play a significant role and I believe will benefit in the next couple of years. And also just uh, Singapore today might be the preferred hub for headquarters of global companies in Southeast Asia. People can send their you know, experts there and, and there are good schools and health, uh, health system is quite, quite good and insurance and safety and security. But I think Malaysia here has a very, very good important role to play once uh, companies feel that Singapore, like the ROI is not there and, and it's it, it, just as a headquarter for the smallest market, like five, six million people, it's it just not worth the investment. Let's go into a different market, a bigger market. Like that that gap, that bridge between still the Western world and a kind of fairly international life versus local presence and, and where does it have make sense to, to be? Malaysia has a role to play as well, and, and I believe could step in here and taking over some of the roles that Singapore play today. Yeah, I, I could certainly see that happening. Kuala Lumpur is a, a wonderful city. Yep. Uh, and as you, you know, communicated earlier, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a great first place uh, to set up shop in Southeast Asia. Absolutely, yep. So I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, HP. Last question, where can listeners find you online? Oh, I don't, I don't have <laughs> such a big uh, presence. Uh, Momentum has a LinkedIn account. I have a personal Instagram account where I'm maybe posting three, three posts per year. Um, so I'm not, not big, big on social media, but I think our Momentum Commerce LinkedIn page would be a good, good place to start. Okay, awesome. So uh, we will make sure that we include all of the relevant links to Momentum Commerce. If anyone that's listening to this podcast is interested in getting support with the Malaysia market or more broadly, cross-border e-commerce in Southeast Asia, or just general e-commerce advisory stuff, HP and the Momentum team really know their stuff. They're great, I think, as you, as you know, after listening to this podcast. So with that, we are done with this episode. Thanks so much for your time, HP. Thanks as well. Thanks for spending your time with us today and listening. I hope you learned something new that will help your business or your career. For new listeners, please find all the resources, links, and show notes at splitdragon.com forward slash podcast. And if you want to continue the conversation and connect with other e-commerce leaders in Southeast Asia, join us in our Discord community. Uh, The link to the community is in our podcast page, splitdragon.com forward slash podcast. This episode of e-commerce in Southeast Asia is sponsored by Split Dragon. Split Dragon offers technology and professional services to help brands, agencies, and sellers enter, launch, and grow their online sales channels in Southeast Asia. 
If you're just getting started, you can use Split Dragon tools like Shopee's sales database or Lazada sales database to understand current product sales volume. And if you're already selling, you can use tools like competitor intelligence and search rank tracking, financial management, and A-B testing to grow your business. Additionally, Split Dragon's professional services has helped large global brands like Unilever, Laneige, and HP, uh, as well as small startups win in Southeast Asia marketplace e-commerce, from advisory and consulting to custom data analytics to running paid ads to launching new products. Split Dragon can help grow your online sales in Southeast Asia. If you want to use data to grow your e-commerce business without the guesswork, please visit our sponsor, splitdragon.com.